Okay. All right, we're gonna get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Abed Ayoub. I'm the National Legal and Policy Director of ADC, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. And for the next few weeks, we're gonna be holding uh, a number of uh, panel sessions and conversations around the 20th anniversary of 9-11. This was intended to be an in-person symposium, uh, which we began planning about a year ago, but unfortunately with you know everything that's happening around COVID, we've been uh, you know, forced to move it online, uh, but that's not a problem. That's uh, allowed us to bring some you know, phenomenal speakers together over the course of the next month. And um, you know, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Chris, who's gonna introduce this session the speakers, I'm gonna be offline. Remember, question and answers can go in the Q&A box at the bottom, uh, and we look forward to a great conversation. So Chris, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Abed. Um, hi everyone, my name is Chris Habibi. I'm the Legislative and Policy Coordinator for ADC. Um, I'm so excited for today's session. We're gonna dive into the national security landscape where we have seen just an incredible amount of change since 9-11. You know, the attacks on 9-11 fundamentally changed how the U.S. government approached intelligence, securing the homeland. You know, we saw the creation of an entirely new department, the Department of Homeland Security, the creation of countering violent extremism programs, and the rise of the surveillance state. So we have a, a fantastic panel today with us. They're all experts on this topic, and I would like to start off by introducing Juliette Kayyem. She's a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government a frequent contributor on CNN and a former United States Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security. Welcome, Ms. Kayyem. Thank you so Thank much for joining you. us. Thanks. And, and an Arab American. Come on. Oh, of course. <laughs> or, or as we like to say, Lebanese American, right? So it's different. <laughs> it's different. I'm so yeah. thrilled to be here and have worked with you guys over these very tumultuous uh, 20 years. It's hard to believe. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so next we have Michael German. He's a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice's Liberty and National Security Program and a former FBI agent where he specialized in domestic terrorism and covert operations. Welcome, Mr. German. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And it's been a pleasure as I moved from law enforcement to the advocacy community to have worked with ADC on a number of issues. <clears throat> that are of uh, concern, not just to the Arab and Muslim community, but to all of Americans out there who are being impacted by national security programs and homeland security programs that unfortunately lack accountability. And I think a lot of the problems that we're facing today, particularly the, the rise of the uh, far right and the law enforcement inattention to, and unfortunately sometimes participation in far right violence, uh, has its roots in the national security state and the, and the war on terrorism that we started after 9-11. So I appreciate you having this discussion. Of course, thank you. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Dr. Joseph Young. He's a former professor of mine at American University School of Public Affairs, where he's focused his research on terrorism and political violence, in addition to, to writing a book on the use of torture after uh, September 11th. Um, welcome, Dr. <clears throat> Young. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Chris. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm really excited to share this discussion with Michael and Juliet, uh, and I'm looking forward to interacting with the audience. Fantastic. Great. So um, we're going to start off um, talking about you know, the government reorganization following 9-11. Um, Congress passed the Homeland Security Act in 2002, which established the Department of Homeland Security. This brought a, a large number of disparate agencies and areas of responsibility under one cabinet level department. Um, so my first question is going to be for, for Ms. Kayyem, how did the creation of DHS impact how the U.S. government treated threats to the homeland? Yeah, so I think overall it's an experiment still worth trying, so I, I really do, and, and also you have to just remember the cost of ending the experiment, right? It's not like these agencies then aren't needed, you still need border enforcement, you know, the abolish ICE, the abolish DHS movements, like you still need an entity that's going to do border enforcement. So long ago I stopped thinking about things I can't control, like, should this have happened? And then think, is there is an experiment that is still worthy? And so I wanna just raise uh, two points in this. I think, I think the answer is yes, for, for two reasons. The first is the extent to which Homeland Security or this sort of defense against all risk was not part of um, our national security um, 
framework can't be underestimated before 9-11. I mean, in other words, it was it was the 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 generals, the spies, the diplomats, the lawyers to a certain extent, but there was no entity that was actually thinking and focusing on the potential for uh, risk. So that's a good thing because you need those people at the table. I think COVID has sort of shown us that, you know, a homeless land security threat is, a, you know, has national security implications for a variety of reasons. The second is um, remember, and this is, you know, I was also a state homeland security advisor. So I come to this with a lot of state experience. Uh, the extent to which the DHS is actually has customers who will notice uh, or who, who didn't have a voice uh, is uh, before DHS is is important. Now those those um, voices are noisy and they're disparate, state, local, territorial, and tribal. They they have diversity of opinions. Think about border enforcement, uh, 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 climate change, uh, whatever else. But but uh, uh, DHS for all of the talk about it, it's only about two hundred and eighty thousand employees. That's big, uh, but it's its largest function is probably writing checks, right? I mean, in others, it distributes to the capacity that we want to build in the homeland. And I think the way that we focus that is good. So I'll be um, positive in, in those senses. And I think to talk about DHS as a sort of, it was created and now how do we assess it? It really is trying in terms, you know, there's been various course corrections. I won't get too political about it. It, it clearly was too focused on immigration in the last administration, and we can talk about some of the uh, uh, challenges, if not abuses, on that. But um, if you thought about the history of DHS, it was created in 2001, but it had a significant course correction in 2005. That is Hurricane Katrina. That is when a nation realized that stopping 19 guys from getting on four airplanes was not able to look at the breadth of risks that it was facing, whether it was cyber, climate change or, or hurricanes, pandemics, which, uh, uh, which we then saw, and also the changing nature of terrorism threat, which we saw first from Al Qaeda to the ISIS, what we like to call the lone wolf, although it's more complicated than that, to now the white supremacist threat. Uh, so those are sort of my takeaway thoughts in terms of rather than rethinking a decision that the unraveling of would have consequences, those things, you know, the as I said before, the abolish ICE movement, are you, are you actually saying there's going to be no immigration enforcement, um, and 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 think how what are ways that we can amend or reform it? Thank you. Yeah, that brings up a, an interesting question about how the the integration of, of agencies of like FEMA into DHS itself made it more of the the check writing capacity that that you had that you uh, spoke about. Um, the other part of DHS was uh, you know homeland security investigations, and so. Mr. German, how did that, you know, integration of a new investigative agency mm -hmm. impact the FBI's ability to conduct uh, investigations into threats? Um, I, I, I'm not sure it, it changed the FBI very much, except that it created a new uh, mm -hmm foe within the community and and you know the same kind of silly high school antics where these agencies fight against one another and try to upstage one another just had another focal point and you know i think so much of the of the difficulty home the department of homeland security has had in getting a, a proper role in the counterterrorism world is because the fbi is predominant in, in that role and doesn't really cooperate well with others. And uh, the, the concept of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, of course, expanded, but I think the development of state and local fusion centers was a reaction to the failure of that system to actually share information with the state and local law enforcement agencies. And DHS attempted to, to gain a role in helping fund and staff those state and local fusion centers, but has refused, I shouldn't say refused, they did require uh, fusion centers to have privacy policies, but they've refused any oversight role. And that's a significant problem because, not just because these 
uh, law enforcement intelligence practices have a tendency to target people because of their political beliefs, race, or religion, uh, and that has continued, uh, but because they are engaging with private sector actors and uh, collecting information that has no uh, frame of accountability for. So we saw last year the blue leaks where one of these private companies was hacked and all kinds of FBI, DHS, Fusion Center intelligence reports, some of which name law enforcement officials, they name uh, subjects of their investigations. You know, this is really information that e even though as an activist, I'm happy that it's out there to show how problematic these uh, institutions are and, and bring some accountability to it. Um, but as a privacy activist, I'm concerned that that this is even possible. And, you know, in, in, in one sense, we're kind of lucky because it appears the, the, the leak was done by hacktivists whose goal was to gain some public accountability. But if they can do it, what do you think hostile foreign intelligence agencies have been doing for the last 20 years, right? This is information that's easily accept, accessible because you have institutions playing a role in a very dangerous game of intelligence collection that don't have any rules by which they uh, protect that information. So they've just become the go-to stop for hack hackers and, and hostile intelligence agencies to get the information that our own tax dollars have funded the collection of. And it's really uh, part of the problem. That's, that's fascinating. So yeah. I think it, it brings in somewhat what Juliet, you had mentioned about in 2005 following Hurricane Katrina. You know, we saw with both the FBI and CIA, you know, COINTELPRO, MKUltra, is there, do you see there is a uh, possibility of similar programs being created? What, what do we think that that threat might be? Mm. That could be for any anyone. <laughs> Joe, you want to go? <laughs> yeah, give me the hard one. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, the thing that I think is kind of exciting about this uh, this discussion and just having these discussions right now is like most of these things are much better when they're out in the light. And you mentioned mm -hmm. Cointel Pro and some of these other previous abuses by the FBI and CIA is a lot of those things didn't come out till way later. Um, yeah. And I'm just hopeful that we're in an era where these sorts of abuses can be called out much more quickly. You know, uh, even if we're talking about Abu Ghraib or some of the other more um, horrific things that happened in the global war on terrorism, yeah. it didn't take us a long time to get it to the light of day. So I'm, uh, I don't wanna speculate about the probability that something yeah. occur, occurs like that, but I do wanna say that I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to shine a light on it and, and deal with it. Yeah, I think that's right. Awesome. Um, I'll stick stick with you, uh, Dr. Young. Uh, let's go more broadly. The, this government reorganization. There's been a lot of, you know, systems analysis of, of kind of what went right, what could be done better. What do you see as kind of what what worked, what didn't work? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. And I, I'll talk about I guess what worked first. And in, in terms of organizational units, right? Pre 9/11 we had a number of departments that have specific crime related units such as organized crime or narcotics units or whatever. But following 9-11, many large urban law enforcement agencies stood up CT specific units to gather and analyze terrorist related information intelligence that I think was a positive sharing uh, process. Many state governments and local governments established fusion centers like Michael was discussing. Um, and this largely was on their own initiative, and DC has one, for example, mm -hmm. to address these gaps in information sharing um, and, and help hopefully ide ideally kind of connect with federal law and uh, government enforcement. Um, Pre-9-11, a lot of that sharing was real crime specific, like I said, but um, you know, around drugs or organized crime, whatever. Now it's more large scale, all kinds of crime, all kinds of hazards, and it's happening under these, managed under these fusion centers. As a researcher, to be fair, I would like more of that data about the efficacy of these future fusion centers uh, being made publicly available um, so we could actually assess if this is a positive change and maybe not surprisingly, it's not easy to get. Um, in, in fairness to governments though, I should say counterterrorism is 
really hard. It's notably hard as the public wants law enforcement uh, and the government to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. Um, and yeah, maybe it's respecting human rights. That would be nice too. And on, on that front, you know, the US government's been pretty effective at disrupting large scale attacks. We haven't seen anything close to 9-11 since 9-11 yeah. uh, on the homeland. Uh, but obviously, I, in my estimation, has done a worse job at respecting the rights of its citizens, especially minorities and more vulnerable populations. And that kind of leads me into the what do we what are we not doing so well? Uh, and there's a decent list here, right, including um, torture, detention, violating civil uh, civil rights. But also, I'll focus again on kind of local law enforcement and something that worries me, which is um, you know from a local law enforcement perspective, police departments moved away from best practices that we know, uh, researchers know, like community policing, um, to a bigger focus on homeland security. Uh, and local law enforcement received military equipment uh, from the wars mm -hmm. that was decommissioned from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, program called 1033. And as we saw dramatically in recent protests and in recent events, the militarization of police has led to really aggressive tactics and increased use of force and violence against civilians. Some folks, some supporters have said, hey, you know, that's reduced crime. Um, but we've seen that's just kind of pushed crime to other spots and it's led to violence against civilians. So it's, I don't think worth, worth the cost. Yeah. So, you know, relative to our discussions here, these police, police abuses have really disproportionately been felt by minority communities yeah. uh, and, and vulnerable communities. If I could add something to that, I mean, I think, you know, when I talked about this course correction in 2005 really was towards in, in, in the field we call all hazards. So we're talking about a particular threat, terrorism, but uh, we, you know, on the state and local and response on the, on sort of right of boom capacity, right? The sort of response capacity, you know, that, that the explosions went off at the end of the Boston Marathon, that it's two brothers who were radicalized or a generator or some piece of critical infrastructure, no one cares, right? At that moment, so you're, you're, you worry, we've, we, we often on the response side worried less about motivation and, and, and issues like, uh, like that. And so, but, and so that was a good period. And I, you know, and, I, and, and, and this is not political, this, this occurred in the second term of the Bush administration both a focus on all hazards for the homeland and then what we call dual use capacity. So you want you don't want to be too specialized. So in some ways, what we saw after 2005 was the sort of despecialization of homeland security. In other words, it just became a sort of all risks, you know, national defenses. That's when we started to talk about the private sector and stuff. That course correction then got halted and just as you know, so where we talk about terrorism and 9-11, with really aligning terrorism with immigration, which was a success, I guess, of the Trump administration um, and viewing immigration through the lens of a national security border enforcement strategy. That was harmful, not just for the humanitarian aspects. It was harmful for the national security expert at, at things because if you're thinking this is your threat, guess what? You know, There's a virus from Wuhan coming across on January, 2020, of which, you had 10 weeks to figure out it was coming across, but you're so focused on that. The other, and as I mentioned, the humanitarian efforts as well. The, the other reason is just to say this, and this happened after 9-11 too, is um, that, uh, that legal migration, which is essential to the well-being of the United States, let alone our own national security, gets drawn into uh, these discussions. And so it's not surprising to me that by the end of the Trump administration, there was a real attack on legal migration, which anyone who, which is not supported by a lot of Republicans either who need workers or, or whatever else. So just something to think about that, that the, 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 we're all old enough to remember what we were afraid of on 9-11. I teach students whose traumatic moment was actually the fiscal crisis, right? That's when their dads lost and moms lost their jobs. Right? They're thinking about it. And, and then there's a new generation that views security, not, not everyone, but security through the lens of migration. And I think I, I just wanna push back a little bit on, on yeah. the, the idea that there has been accountability uh, mm -hmm. in the national security context. And particularly that, that, uh, that, that somehow there's evidence that all the extra authorities and greater cloak of secrecy we've given to these institutions and extra resources 
uh, have made us safer. I, I don't think many Americans today, after a year of a mishandled pandemic, after the effects of climate change are becoming clearer and clearer in, in our everyday lives, and an attempted coup against our government, yeah. Uh, would say that they feel safer today than they did on September 10th, 2001, right? So, you know, and, and I would argue that although, the, you know, obviously the death toll was, was not anywhere uh, uh, near even other smaller terrorist attacks, you know, the, the threat to our democracy that was uh, evident in, in the attack on the Capitol and the events that preceded it and have followed beyond it, I think are more dangerous to our democracy than, uh, than anything any foreign terrorist can, can do. Uh, with the fusion centers, you know, there was some oversight, right? Congress, the, the Senate Homeland Security Committee produced a report in 2012 that identified that fusion centers were uh, problematic for civil liberties and produced very little uh, value and a lot of garbage, right? Yeah. No accountability for that. Not a single reform was put in place because of that report. Uh, so same with torture, right? We had ex exposure because we have whistleblowers and we have uh, good investigative journalists, but that exposure resulted in a seven-year quest mm -hmm. uh, by the Senate to, to investigate it and we still haven't seen that report, right? We saw, yeah. we saw an executive summary and nobody who authorized or participated in that program was punished, right? So that we have somebody who was uh, instrumental in managing the program actually nominated to, to run the agency and get through. So, so the idea that there's been a counter, I, and I think that's a huge part of the problem with our government that we have, we have mm -hmm conditioned Americans to believe it's okay for them not to know what the government is actually doing and not to hold anybody responsible and that politicians are allowed to politicize these issues in a way that the truth becomes negotiable. And I think that's how we ended up in the position we are now where what is true depends on who you are looking to as your uh, favorite politician and falling in line with what they're saying rather than what is objectively true. I think that's that's a fantastic yeah. segue into you know a discussion about surveillance. And I just also want to mention um, everyone watching, if you have questions, feel mm -hmm. free to use the, the QA button down at the bottom to into your question. Um, so the rise of a surveillance state, as yeah. I'm calling it, is uh it, probably one of the biggest impacts that the post 9-11 national security world has. You know, the, the targeting of Arab Americans, particularly Muslims, you know, to the large scale collection of data by the NSA. Um, I'm gonna start this one off with Dr. Young. Mm -hmm. Is there a through line of both, you know, policy, public opinion that led from 9-11 to surveillance as we see it today? Yeah, and thank you again for your question. I, this, you know, this is a topic I've done a little research on, and you know, this public policy and our government's policies after terrorism. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna, I'll talk about this a little bit more broadly than just surveillance, but speak about tactics that violate rights, mm -hmm. yet are highly supported by most Americans. Uh, and in in times of threat, like immediately after 9/11, the public is generally highly supportive of both kinetic and intrusive responses, like surveillance, like torture. And so it's, it's, that's a dicey time to try and change public opinion and change policies. And if, if the right government comes in to do those things, it's hard to switch people's views on it. Um, and in those situations, citizens are more likely to support those kinds of things. What, what we found in our recent book, and this is a book with my colleague, Aaron Carnes, is that it's much easier to persuade folks. We do a bunch of experiments trying to persuade folks, but uh, it's much easier to persuade them to do harsh things like torture uh, than it is to persuade them not to. Uh, and especially when there's threat. And when the US is you know, under threat, getting public opinion mobilized in favor of harsh interrogations or broad surveillance or something like this, that's a pretty easy task than it is to try and get people to say, hey, let's be thoughtful about this. Let's think about um, you know, rule of law. Let's consider how, what the best way to do this. And you know, what that suggests to me is that we should absolutely be having these conversations at a time like right now. 
because this is a time we're not we're not explicitly at war, uh, although we could argue that. But um, a time where people are not immediately persuaded that harsh we have to do these harsh things to protect the homeland, and we can sort of implement policies that hopefully are are less so. Um, mm. Again, to the extent that we believe that there are some uh, root causes of terrorism that are exacerbated by harsh government responses, we should be advocating for discretion by our government and anticip yeah. anticipation uh, that in the times of threat, few people are gonna listen to us. That's the exact time when we're gonna we'll feel mm -hmm. the drums of war. Um, so that's, you know, I think the right prescription for reducing violence, but it's a tough thing to do um, when, when we're faced with the big threat. Yeah. That's, that's a, uh, that's a great point. Um, Julia, do you see the necessary changes happening internally, whether, you know, through congressional oversight or within the administration itself, or is this something that, you know, activists on the outside have to be pushing the administration Congress to do? I think, I mean, things, so, so much has changed in a good way. I mean, just the, the way we talk about things. I mean, within government, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote because I've, I've been thinking about 20 years later. I was put on the National Commission on Terrorism. So that was the post, um, and that was the post Africa embassy bombings. I, uh, yeah, um, the coal happened during when we were meeting. This was the Jerry Bremer Commission, the one that warned of, you know, this Al Qaeda and bin Laden are not going away. Um, there were no Arab or Muslim Americans in the national security community. And while I was probably qualified, I was 29 years old to get a congressional appointment. I had security clearance. I was a lawyer. I worked for the Department of Justice, but there, were, there weren't a lot of voices. And the voices that were out there were really focused on the Israeli-Palestinian <laughs> Israeli conflict, which is how, you know, it's like, you know, you know, it's like women, like I'm not, you know, I'm not a specialist in gender issues, right? It's like you're, you're sort of pegged for the thing that everyone, I think that has changed a lot in terms of both the way the threat is talked about, like the things that I would hear in those rooms 20 years ago about how Arabs or Muslims are, are talked about, um, let alone having seats at the table. So I am optimistic about that when you actually look at uh, appointments, at least, you know, in the Biden administration, in the new Biden administration. So don't underestimate Act, you know, public service as a form of activism, it is. You can, you can do it on the outside, you could do it from the academy, you could do it wherever, but that is also one. Um, the, the second is I think what we should focus on um, a lot is, I mean, obviously, and I think, I think it's being heard is, is to focus on the real threat. Um, this is, uh, and which is the white supremacy threat right now. Uh, because for a couple of reasons. One is that threat is closely aligned with anti-Arab sentiment. I mean, it, it cracks me up I'm gonna crack, in a bad way, but the idea that your average everyday rate, white supremacist racist makes distinctions between Arab Muslims, Arab Christians, and Jews is like ridiculous. I mean, in this way, we're all the same, right? Like, I mean, and you know, and 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 the silence, although not so true anymore, early on of Jewish groups from condemning uh, the racism spewing from uh, uh, various elements of, uh, of of the country, you know, it, it was it was dangerous to, because I mean, you knew what you knew what was next with with a, a lot of a lot of this the racism behind it. So I think it's important to focus um, our eyes on the real threat, recognizing there's still other threats out there, uh, uh, and I think the government is receptive to that. Finally, I'll just say quickly, there are, you know, even if something horrible were to happen, maybe not the magnitude of 9-11, um, but, you know, whatever, you know, in terms of a threat that people would target the Arab and Muslim communities being responsible and demand that we apologize for our people and all the stuff that that is, a, you know, there are things that did work in curbing uh, some of the craziness that falls out. One is just seeking allies in communities that may not be our allies on other issues, including the Jewish community or, or whatever else um, in terms of national security. The other is a real focus on uh, sunset provisions. I think in the, whatever one thinks of the Patriot Act, I think in, in hindsight, the fact that a lot of those rules were in the compromise sunsetted when we knew we, knew we were mad, so to speak, uh, on September 18th or whenever it was first proposed or October 18th. 
But we also knew it would be different two years from now. So that's a tactic that I think about a lot uh, that, uh, that we learned at DHS you know, we don't have a color code system anymore. If we, if, if, if the alert system goes up here, it's an advisory system, it automatically goes down after two weeks because recognizing how politically difficult it would be for Secretary of Homeland Security to say there's no threat. That's a good reform. That's fascinating. Um, and it somewhat leads to a question for, for you, Mike, um, you know, talking about the threat of white supremacists, um, is there, you know, talking about a need for a, a domestic terrorism statute? Um, I know that you have thoughts on that, and I, I want to give you the opportunity to kind of talk about specifically a crime of domestic terrorism. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, th this was a strange argument when, when I started hearing uh, Justice Department officials uh, begin to float it around 2015 where you know, I was as an FBI agent and investigated domestic terrorism cases on joint terrorism task forces back in the 1990s. And nobody suggested we didn't have significant authority to uh, take on those cases and they resulted in successful prosecution. So it was sort of odd to me that the Justice Department was saying they had no domestic terrorism law when you can open the US code and there is an entire chapter called terrorism. Yeah. And, and they made this odd argument that, well, because the way the statute defines domestic terrorism doesn't include in the definition a penalty, then there's no domestic terrorism law. But if you look at the definition of international terrorism, it likewise has no penalty. So it, it was this odd, uh, fallacious argument that was brought up when, in fact, I produced a report called wrong priorities on fighting terrorism that documented the 57 federal crimes of terrorism, 51 of which apply to domestic acts as defined in the statute, which is how a statute works. Um, uh, but th they would just keep modifying their argument in a way, you know, they said, well, it doesn't apply to material support. Actually, yes, it does. And the Justice Department has prosecuted domestic terrorism cases using the material support statute. You know, so. It, it was this moving argument that was really just the, the law enforcement agencies wanting more that has nothing to do with their authorities. And what was interesting to me, it, it was mostly people who had come from the national security side of the FBI and uh, uh, the Justice Department who were arguing that the tools that the international terrorism agents and investigators and prosecutors have are much stronger. But if you look at the statistics, the Justice Department prosecutes twice as many domestic terrorism cases than international terrorism cases, even though they're only assigned in the FBI 20% of the resources. So with 20% of the resources, they prosecute twice as many cases, and yet they're arguing that there's some deficiency on the domestic terrorism side when any, any objective person would say the deficiency is in the other direction. And if you look at those cases, often they're not investigating or prosecuting actual terrorists. Many of them are sting operations where the only named terrorist group involved is the person who is the government agent saying that they're part of a foreign terrorist group. There's no real foreign terrorist group involved. So whether that's actually preventing terrorism rather than manufacturing a plot for the purpose of stopping it for the purpose of then going to Congress and saying, look, we stopped this, this terrible plot that was entirely the creation of government agents doesn't seem to be effective counterterrorism. And here's the problem, is that, it, is that that methodology has become so ingrained in the FBI that I think they, they no longer understand how to address far right violence, right? After, I mean, clearly over the last four years, we've seen white supremacists and far right militants engage in public violence all across the country, unpoliced by the locals. Yeah. And even though interstate travel is often involved, unpoliced by the FBI. And the FBI is still, and the Justice Department are treating January 6th as if it was a standalone event. Yeah. That, it, that it came out of nowhere and nothing has happened since, when what they don't seem to realize is that many of the people there became accustomed to using violence at rallies 
in previous protests. And there's an awful lot of evidence if you go back a couple of years involving these same actors. And this violence is continuing, but what you hear the, the Justice Department talking about is broader surveillance of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, more, more of these sting operations targeting uh, white supremacists rather than saying, pointing it out as I try to all the time, the FBI today cannot tell you how many people white supremacists killed last year mm -hmm. because they don't collect that data. They can't tell you if there's a rise or a fall in white supremacist violence because they don't track that. Now, that's just a matter of priorities. Yeah. They can track how many bank robberies happen. I would suggest they can track how many white supremacist murders happen if they make that a priority. And that what we have to do is get them back focused on investigating actual violence, not what somebody is saying online, but actual violence. You didn't have to be part of any dark web chat room to have known that there was gonna be an attack on the Capitol. I don't follow any of those sites. I had a, a belly full of what white supremacists had to say when I spent a year with them undercover. I know what their arguments are. Uh, I just watch. I just watch what's happening around the country when they when they commit violence, and I and I knew that it was happening. Uh, there was a hotel in D.C. that shut down uh, because they knew what was going to happen. How is it that this hotel had better intelligence than than the FBI and DHS and and the fusion centers and this network we built? When we look at the problems, it's the same. Agents are reporting information up, and managers are choosing not to. Uh, uh, pay attention to it and not to address it and not to prioritize it. So here we are at bookends at 20 years and the problem of information management by policymakers is the same. Yeah. And I would argue we have even less accountability over these agencies today than we did 20 years ago. Hmm. And that raises somewhat a, a, a question for, for you, Joe, is are there changes to, you know, the uniform crime reporting that you see could help in quantitative analysis of, of crime in, in, this, in the realm of national security? That's a good question. I, I don't really uh, use the UCR very much because um, for some of the reasons Michael just talked about, uh, <laughs> right? And, and you know, from, I, were you, I can't remember if you were an intern at START or not, but START is you know at University of Maryland they collect terrorism data and they catalog who the perpetrators are and they have distinguishing so Start can tell you how many uh, right, far right attacks there were last year uh, and you know I, I know from looking at their data the number of far right attacks you know over the last decade is compared to the to any other group it is you know there's a big difference and so if we're talking about kind of structuring our priorities based on data Start would support my contention here um, and that's you know so I think. You know, similar to Michael's point, if, if the FBI were serious about wanting to address this issue, they would collect all the data regardless of who the perpetrators were, and then they'd let the data tell them what the, what the dangers are. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to one final section of questions. It's uh, about countering violent extremism. So we saw, you know, following 9-11, there was a, a strong focus on how to interdict these potential extremists, you know, led to a number of programs being created, aiming at identifying individuals that are susceptible to quote unquote radicalization, quote unquote violent extremism. But, you know, a lot of these indicators were just, you know, generalized everyday activities or expressions, and then ended up disproportionately targeting Arab Americans. So um, I'm gonna start with uh, Mike. You know, you've been on the forefront of advocating for, for structural changes to these programs. Um, what were some of like the, the fundamental mistakes that were made when these programs were established and were there any positives? You know, obviously when we want fundamental change, there's, there's a reason for it, but were there any positives come out of these programs? Uh, so my initial concern with, with this programming and it started out as counter radicalization mm -hmm. and uh, having you know grown up wanting to be an FBI agent and then realizing that dream and being an FBI agent I had studied a lot about the FBI and the FBI's first radicals division uh, was in the early 1900s run by this guy, young <laughs> agent named J. Edgar Hoover 
Uh, and that concept of radicalization had been used by the FBI for its 100 year history to target groups it perceived as political threats rather than as uh, security threats. And so when I heard this language being resurrected for this new, or, you know, what they were arguing was a new threat, I knew that it would lead to the same kind of overreach that, that animated the Palmer raids back in the early 1900s and the COINTELPRO program in the 1960s and other uh, uh, abusive uses of, of law enforcement surveillance powers. Um, so, so, you know, the idea that, that our, our mission as law enforcement and intelligence officers, whether at the FBI, DHS, state and local fusion centers, uh, the, the foreign intelligence services, is no longer to identify the people who are, who are doing harm, who yeah. are engaging in crime, but instead look at the people who might do harm in the future and interdict them from doing harm in the future. Number one, your, your pool of people is huge, right? Any one of us might potentially commit a crime in the future. So when government is faced with this problem of, okay, I have this huge pool of people that might cause a problem in the future, how do I whittle that down? Well, I whittle it down through a political process of identifying who I think is the most serious threat. So if you look at the FBI, which even today is more than 80% male, or 80% male and more than 80% white and 80% male, roughly, I think 83 to one of those. Anyway, the average white male FBI agent isn't worried about white supremacist violence in his community, right? So automatically he's going to look to other groups, even though, you know, and that's one of the reasons they don't collect objective data, right? Because yeah. that would upset yeah. their ability to target who they want to target. So, you know, this system of countering violent extremism was flawed from the beginning because yeah. it rested on this theory of counter radicalization. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, what they call the indicators just become another form of profiling. Mm -hmm. And they can call it behavioral profiling, but if the behavior they're identifying is going to a mosque, that's not really behavioral profiling, yeah. right? So, yeah. so it, it was very clear that this program was really just a, a surveillance and informant development program targeting directly the Muslim community. And now they're talking about broadening it to other communities. Mm -hmm. I would say the only positive that came out of it, just to finish up, mm -hmm. was that, uh, that the communities recognized what was going on. And, and many of them organized themselves. In Minneapolis, which was one of the target cities, you know, a group of youths created See Me, Not CVE. You know, and, and that kind of community organizing was really important to uh, mitigating the harms from the program. Julia, you had something to add? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, I mean, I, I, I don't have much to add. I wanna just say the affirmative part of this, which is, uh, in the world of counterterrorism, uh, how how you know in the history of terrorist organizations, how do they end? Because they rarely win. So how do they end? They end through, you know, decap decapitation either literally or figuratively of the leader, right? G get that person off of platforms. You know, get 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 the social media where we're saying whoever your leader is, right? I'm not I'm not you know whatever the group is, but the second is make the terrorist organization look like the losing team. You saw this with ISIS. As ISIS began, because terrorist groups need money and recruitment. That's what they need. And the narrative of winning brings them new bodies to die and, and, and money and, and support and resources. So a narrative of losing is actually your best form of de-radicalization because people will be less interested in groups. So, I just, I think we are so undervaluing the 500 or 600 post once uh, January 6 cases and what that's doing to the radicalization threat in the United States. I have no doubt we have radical elements. Uh, we have a, a, a former president who's radicalizing in many ways, although he's deplatformed. But if, if you're someone who's who's thinking I need, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I sort of believe, I agree with these people and they look like they're winning. And then you see 
oh my, you know, they're all turning on each other. They're all disclosing secrets. They're all in jail or they're getting fined or they're crying hysterically, like all that stuff. That's huge for de-radical, you know, for countering a terrorist threat. So I, so, so even if we're not, if we're not doing CVE, which I agree with Mike with, or, you know, that is not the way forward. We have all these other terrific tools that I wish we would, we should see those prosecutions as counter radicalization tools, because they are. Fantastic. Um, and a little bit more from you, Juliet, on kind of yeah. the evolution you saw internally from DHS yeah. on how they approached CVE. I know that there was iterations of it, including now the Center for Prevention Programs yeah. and Partnerships. Yeah. Um, how can you just briefly talk about that evolution? So I actually experienced it on the state side. I was we the the group had been a form uh, a form called Bridges, and I'll say you know it was. Um, I mean, you know, there's something to having forums uh, where different groups sit down and there's access to FBI agents. And I think the department was good about reach. It started to get better about reaching out to the community after attacks or incidents that might have implicated the community. Both Presidents Bush, you know, when something would happen, they would reach out, they would say say the right things, which like, you know, that brings the tone down, right? I mean, you know, we, which is important, um, but there's just the, there just wasn't that much quantity. Like, and I think part of, of to, to sustain an effort like this, I mean, we, we all know the statistics with the community. I mean, it's, we're relatively boring people. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Like, it's like, we're doctors and dentists. And, you know, it's like, it's not like there's like that much. And I think the government, I didn't mean that we're lots of fun, actually, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we're not, you know, we're not. But so I think one of the things like that would frustrate me was they would say, well, we have to, the government would say, we have to reach out to the Arab and Muslim community. Let's go to the Imam. And you're sitting there and you're like looking at all your Lebanese girlfriends and saying that imam does not represent, you know, my life right now or the professionals and stuff. So part of it was just like it had this totally insular view of the of the of the community. And then the community was not radical. I wasn't even interested in radicalization. Like it was just like, you know, we as I say, like we want to be dentists and lawyers and doctors, you know, it's like that's where that's who we are. So I think that that was um, that in some ways that uh, was also part of the, the the sort of recognition that this was an experiment not not worth doing. Um, and as I said, is I I don't think the government should be in the world of de-radicalization as as some as uh, as a goal in and of itself. The tools we already have, prosecution. Uh, 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 civil suits, investigation, all that, that goes very, very far. Um, and, and would and like to see more of that. But if I'm, I'm relatively, you know, just to end with the same point as last time, like you want to do, you want to, you want to counter, you want to counter the terrorist threat narrative right now. It's not, it's not countering violent extremism efforts. It's the 500 prosecutions because we're seeing we're seeing that in the groups. I mean, people monitoring their websites. They are in trouble. Awesome. And so, I'm going to turn to Joe. With you know, a lot of this said about the the actual research that DHS is using to support their their programs. What role does academic research or should academic research play? Um, in assessing the, the efficacy and moving forward, the structure of programs like this? Well, I think in at least two ways. I mean, the first way is thinking about why people do violent things. And, you know, I think a lot of people pre 9 11 and then even somewhat post 9 11 presuppose that uh, these people who commit political violence are like serial killers or murderers. And almost all of the research we have says they're not. They're not monsters that anyone really can be involved in political violence. And we have studies of individuals who engaged in it. And I've interviewed folks who've been foreign fighters and you know they can be white, black, brown, men, women, Sikh, Muslim, Christian, Jews. It doesn't matter, Buddhists, right? So it's for my, mon for my money, uh, the way of thinking about it, like we can just deprogram someone's mind and get them out of this is not very useful because if everyone can eventually be violent, 
um, then it isn't just something about our the way that we're thinking about something. There are certain conditions that create likelihood of violence and don't. And so what Michael was talking about, we, we have these huge lists, right? We have these no-fly lists, these terrorist watch lists that are a million people that are potentially violent. I, I would say that list should be larger, but how do we actually get to the individuals who are likely to be violent? And that, if you can figure that out, that's amazing. I really don't think we can. Um, but if we have a better understanding of the circumstances where people are likely to be violent, and you know, again, one of the, if, if we believe in sort of these root causes that mm -hmm. there, there are aggrievements that people can be involved in. And, and certainly, you know, if we wanna look at violence in the, in the Muslim world, you know, having really repressive states that didn't allow political participation from people from Syria to Saudi Arabia, and they weren't able to express their grievances in normal ways. Uh, and then you have US supporting those violent uh, governments that's a recipe for political violence, right? And so I, I'm, so that's part one of why I'm not very excited about CVE, but part two is none of the research on CVE is worth anything. And I'm, mm -hmm. I know I'm probably pissing all the CVE off, people off, but you know, to do any kind of good research, whether we're talking about looking at a new COVID vaccine or whatever, we have to do you know, trials. We have to do randomized controlled trials. We have to have a control group and a uh, treatment group and none of the CV research has done this and so like the people always talk about oh the Saudi Arabian program is really super successful they have a we have we first of all we're taking Saudi Arabia's word on it and then second of all there's no control group they said hey they're fixed um, and so you know without sort of real research I don't think we can say anything about those programs and unless they you know somebody wants to pay me a lot of money to do it which I'm happy to do I don't think uh, that we can say anything about success in CV. Mm -hmm. And let, if I could just add to that, uh, you know, because I, I think the, the point Joe made is, is a good one, right? That we have this you know, growing terrorist list that gets so, so large that what it really does is create an accidental triage, right? Uh, uh, Tamerlan Tsarnaev pinged the watch list three times when he traveled to Russia, tried to, bought a ticket to Russia, traveled to Russia, tried to join a terrorist group, which he told the FBI was not, he did not have plans to travel to Russia. Yeah. Should have been a clue that something's wrong here. Uh, but nobody responded to those three pings. And when asked why, all the DHS and FBI officials said, well, there were too many people traveling that day who were on the watch list. Well, you know, structure fires in the United States are a problem. They kill far too many people. And we take a lot of serious measures, including putting a fire alarm in everybody's house and, and in every building. But if you set off that fire alarm without a real fire, there's a criminal punishment you face because we know that false alarms cause dull the response. And yet in the counterterrorism world, we have see something, say something that is just creating these false alarms that creates these false suspects that go on these lists that then create false pings that completely dull the response when actual things happen. And that's what we see over and over again, where whether it's a school shooting or whether it's a, a, a terrorist act that somebody had warned somebody in law enforcement about it and had been pushed up the chain, you know, including January 6th. And, you know, the thing to keep in mind about this is again, when you have all these warnings, you pay attention, you know, the policy makers pay attention to what they think is the most important uh, uh, threat for, from their perspective. And, uh, you know, unfortunately with the training that, that counter-terrorist officials received, whether it's from the FBI, DHS, DOD, Spencer Ackerman did award-winning uh, reporting on this, it was heavily anti-Muslim. And that put, these, these counterterrorism officials in a mindset that was very biased and put them on the same ideological side as the white supremacists and far right militants who hated Muslims and Arabs because they were Muslim and Arab. And so 20 years later, when you see law enforcement acting in concert with white supremacists and far right militants, none of us should be surprised, right? They, they have been trained that, that you know, hordes of terrorists are coming over the southern border and that, you know, the, with these nativist ideas, you know, border militias are seen as uh, an adjunct to, to border control, not a, a threat to our democracy. So, you know, that kind of change has created a problem because it's not just the general population we have to worry about, 
right? These, these agencies that we entrust with a lot of power to protect us are actually influenced by these same ideas. You know, the, the racism and white supremacy and far right militancy in law enforcement, in the military, DHS is doing a review. The Justice Department and the FBI have not said they're doing a review, right? So we have to uncover that problem. You know, why is it that the FBI remains a white male organization predominantly? It's not by accident. We, we can count the numbers. Every FBI director since Hoover has said, this is a problem we need to correct. It's not corrected because they don't really want to correct it, right? Because these structural, this structural racism is baked into the system. And particularly when you're talking about security issues, the, the, the way they think about it is better safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have somebody I trust and the people I trust look like me and have a similar background to me. And the people who I don't trust are the people who don't look like me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm gonna open it up uh, for questions from our audience. Um, again, as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Um, I am, I, we do have a question that's coming in from Facebook. Um, I think maybe, Julia, you might be best uh, able to answer this. It, what can be done to decouple national security from immigration? Yeah. Is it even possible under this climate? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it is. I, I mean, one is just how are we uh, 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 defining it in terms of um, uh, uh, our priorities? So, uh, look, we are going to need an immigration enforcement mechanism. That I actually think when you talk about architecture of government with DHS, because I actually think separating the naturalization aspects of the old INS from the enforcement aspects of the new ICE was a bad idea because it, it just simply created a solo immigration is about immigration is about enforcement it's about future flows it's about humanitarian efforts it's about all of them and unfortunately we in the design of DHS, there was a, a sole focus on enforcement. And then you had USCIS sort of sitting out there, you know, collecting fees for people to come in, but with no policy strategy over what is our immigration. So I think one way we can align it is, is, to, is to view immigration through the lens that most people view it, which is it's, yes, it's about enforcement, but it's about future flows. And it's about uh, the, the 12 or 14 million people here who need some pathway to citizenship. And if we can get those three aligned, people will see this is not an enforcement or national security issue, it's a larger issue about the, the utter negligence. And we've just been playing whack-a-mole for years because no one can, can, can uh, you know, solve this, this difficult uh, 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 problem. I think the other is just quickly is just the extent to which uh, we need to view um, our access to the world and the world's access to us um, as, uh, as a national security, uh, as an important national security strategy as, as we figure out, I'm not saying anything new, what it will be like to live with an ascendant China uh, that will offer benefits uh, to the world that, uh, that, you know, 10 years ago, we would have thought that's inconceivable, but uh, let's just say we, you know, America's response to COVID, for example, is not something that we're going to be able to sell. So, so part of what we are able to sell is our freedoms. And those freedoms, when people experience them here, is something that uh, I think they marvel at and maybe sometimes get overwhelmed by. So I think we have to view immigration through the lens of, okay, there's things we're now, we now can't compete on for a variety of reasons. Uh, China has a presented us with a different model, sort of semi-free market with no, no, uh, no democracy. That's a model that seems to be working for them for now. Um, and what's our model, right? And a lot of that is gonna be our openness on immigration. That's a, that's a good selling point. That's fascinating. Um, and uh, I also, I don't wanna to forget to mention, um, you have edited a a book that's coming out soon, am I correct? Right, me? Yes, you. Yeah, so my, I, I, oh, well, I'm gonna go off because, um, hold on one second, hold on one second, hold on, let me get it. Yes, we had a book come out with, um, I have another deadline, it's funny you say that, because I have another deadline for another book, but this was an edited volume with Chap Lawson 
and Alan Burson uh, for MIT Press. I'll put it in the thing. This is a, um, an academic book, but actually it's, we, are, we designed it for the lay reader called Beyond 9-11, um, Homeland Security for the 21st Century. Um, and it gives both the history, sorry, where we were, where we are, and then how to think of Homeland Security beyond, for example, 9-11 and through the lens of terrorism. So um, yeah. It came out, I, you know, it's a great book. It, you know, any book that came out during COVID, it was hard. Uh, <laughs> as everyone nods their head, it was, you know, it's like, uh, but you, thank you for the opportunity to say it. Beyond 9-11, get it on Amazon. Oh, put it in the chat. I will. I love this group. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I know I told my panelists that we would be over by three, so we are- Okay, wait, I, let me put my chat in. Hold on. Yes, yeah, okay. I, I'm gonna, I have a couple of things I need to, to kind of close out with, so you have you have okay. more than enough time. I love um, it. Thank you. So I want to thank our phenomenal panelists. I think this has been a great and insightful conversation. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's joined to watch either here on Zoom or on Facebook. Um, if you're interested in learning more about ADC, you know the work that we do. Sign up for our newsletter or make a donation. You can find us at adc.org, um, and we are going to. In addition to this symposium where, you know, over the next few weeks, we're going to be hosting sessions on immigration, on media, um, on a number of different topics. We're also going to be hosting our national convention, um, October 8th and 9th in Anaheim, California. And the information for that is also on our website, adc.org. Um, thank you. Our panelists thank are you. phenomenal. Um, Thanks, Mike. And I hope... Joe. All right, everyone have a great rest of uh, your day. Thanks. Bye.